Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Robert Montgomery and Audrey Totter in Lady in the Lake. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Almost all of us, at one time or another, have a secret hankering to play detective. Tonight, we give you that opportunity to join in solving one of the screen's most baffling murder mysteries. You'll meet the possible suspects, and you'll find the clues in Metro-Golden-Mare's thrilling screen hit, Lady in the Lake, based on Raymond Chandler's novel and currently playing in theaters throughout America. And you'll have the help of Robert Montgomery in the starring role of ace detective Philip Marlowe. Co-starred with Bob is that exciting new performer, Audrey Totter, who adds romantic interest to our story, at the same time that she stirs up plenty of action on her own. For women are often as persistent as men in tracking down the answer to a problem. And when it comes to the problem of caring safely for fine fabrics, they found a ready answer in Lux Flakes. Uh, Now, I won't say it takes any detective work to discover the merits of Lux Flakes, but their ever-increasing popularity does reflect on the smartness of our modern housewives. We invite them now to exercise that smartness in solving the mystery of The Lady in the Lake, starring Robert Montgomery as Philip Marlowe and Audrey Totter as Adrienne Fromsett. My name is Marlowe, Philip Marlowe. Occupation, private detective. You know, somebody says, follow that guy, so I follow him. Or, uh, find that female, so I find her. And what do I get out of it? Ten bucks a day in expenses. Right now, you're hearing a lot about a murder. They call it the case of the lady in the lake. That's a good title. It fits. But what you've heard about is one thing, and the real thing is something else again. There's only one guy who knows that. I know it. I started finding out about it a few days before Christmas. I was tired of being pushed around for nickels and dimes, so I decided I'd write about murder. I pounded out a story and sent it to the Kingsby Publications Incorporated, specialists in literary gore. Oh, come in, Mr. Marlowe, and hear about the story you wrote. Yeah. Yeah, I got a letter from a guy named A. Fromsett. I'm Fromsett. Adrian Fromsett, to be precise. Tell me something, Mr. Marlowe. Have you done much writing? No. You do very well for a beginner. Well, it's based on an authentic case. Uh, You run this publishing business all by yourself, Miss Fromsett? No, no, Mr. Kingsby runs it. Tell me, are there really detectives like the one in your story who never lie, cheat, or double-cross a client? Yeah, there are a couple of dopes like that. Good. Then you were writing about yourself. Look, you don't really want to buy my story, do you? I was about to offer you $200. Oh, no, you weren't. Why don't you quit being cute? The real reason I'm here is because you want a smooth operator who keeps his mouth shut. When you read my story, you said, that's my boy. He's dumb, he's brave, and he's cheap. Am I right? Partly. Then why all this Mickey Mouse about my story? I want you to find Mr. Kingsby's wife without his knowing you're looking for her. She's a vicious woman, a liar. I don't want to be nosy, Miss Fromsett, but what makes that any of your business? I handle all of Mr. Kingsby's affairs. He wants to divorce her. And I don't like your manners. I'm not selling my manners. I'm not selling my story either. I don't like getting mixed up with a tricky female, even one as good-looking as you who wants to dispose of the boss's wife just so she can marry him herself. People don't talk to me like that, Mr. Marlowe. Maybe somebody should talk to you like that more often. I beg your pardon? Hogan Mindary, this is Philip Marlowe. He submitted a story. Mr. Marlowe, Mr. Kingsby. Hi. Always nice to see one of our writers, Mr. Marlowe. But he isn't one of our writers. He just turned down an offer of $200. Rather indignantly, too. But maybe he's right, Derry. This story has part of Mr. Marlowe's soul in it. I would say it's worth $500 as souls go these days. Congratulations, Mr. Marlowe. A businessman as well as a writer, eh? And a private detective. Detective? That's what makes the story so authentic. 
It's so full of, uh, what would you say it's full of, Mr. Marlowe? Short sentences. Adrian, if there's anything you want before I leave... I don't believe so, dearie. Oh, good night, darling. Good night. Glad to have met you, Mr. Marlowe. Yeah. $500, eh? 200 for your story, 300 for your services in finding Mrs. Kingsby. You don't need any help there, darling. Not you. Please don't be too difficult. I do need help. Like I need four thumbs. I wonder how it would be to discuss this over a couple of ice cubes. Would you care to try? Imagine you needing ice cubes. Sure, Miss Frompson. Let's try. She had a very cozy apartment, Miss Frompson did. She left me alone while she fixed a drink. I couldn't help spotting the telegram. It lay there staring at me on top of the piano. It was addressed to Darius Kingsby. Going to Juarez, it said, to get a divorce and marrying Chris Lavery in Mexico. Your loving ex-wife-to-be, Crystal. If you're going to take this case, Mr. Marlowe, the first person you should see is Chris Lavery. Oh, who's he? Crystal Kingsley ran away with him a month ago, or so we thought. A month ago, eh? Take him that long to get to El Paso? Who said anything about El Paso? A telegram on the piano. Why didn't you tie it on my ear? I might have found it quicker. Oh. What's the mystery if Kingsby's wife is in Mexico? The mystery is that Chris Lavery's here in town, and she isn't. She's vanished. And the telegram's a phony, huh? Must be. Maybe you had it sent. Oh, very funny. If she's missing, why isn't Kingsby looking for her? I don't know. Maybe thinks she's off on a toot. But a Mexican divorce with no property settlement? Oh, no, that's not Crystal. Besides, she'd never marry Chris Lavery. Why not? You don't marry the Chris Laveries of this world. You just lend them all the money they need and forget to ask for it back. You seem to know all about him. I see I'm wasting your time, Mr. Marlowe. Why don't you just run along now and play with your fingerprint collection? Yeah. Lavery, eh? Where does he live? Bay City. 676 Altair Street, the edge of the canyon. And you hope he throws me into it, huh? One more question, Miss Frompsett. What would happen if I kissed you? Why don't you try and see? Do you always close your eyes when you think somebody's going to kiss you? What stopped you? Did you close your eyes when Lavery kissed you? Get out. You want to marry Kingsby because Lavery jilted you, huh? Get out. Sure, and I'll see Lavery. But don't try to be cute anymore. Just edit my manuscript. Yes. I plan to smash the emotion right out of it. That's the manuscript. This is me. Good night, sweetheart. Yes, I'm Lavery, Mr. Marlowe. Come right on in, sir. Well, I declare, business must be bad if you have to go from door to door soliciting clients. Look, Uncle Tom, I don't need a job. I've got one, and if you tell me where Mrs. Kingsby is, I'll stop bothering you. I haven't seen Crystal in two months, and I've never been to El Paso, if that's what you're about to ask me. Oh, you know about the telegram, huh? Why, yes. Miss Adrian told me. Miss Adrian did, did she? Well, I guess there's nothing to do then but go to the cops. Uh, For some reason, Mr. Marlowe, I don't think Mr. Kingsby would allow that, sir. He might have to, to protect himself in case anything's happened to his wife. Happened, sir? Crystal Kingsby has money. Once in a while, boys like you have to make it the hard way. You offend me, Mr. Marlowe. Loosen up, Lavery. You'll save yourself a lot of trouble. I'll never speak disrespectfully of a lady. Not even one as... as fascinating as Mrs. Kingsby was. Was? Sir? Oh, just a slip of the tongue, Mr. Marlowe. No, no, I don't hanker for any part of Mrs. Kingsby. The little lady must have sent that telegram just to embrangle me. Uh, embrangle you? Oh, yes. You're a Yankee. You wouldn't understand. But pardon me, sir. Do you have the time? What's the matter? Your clock embrangled, too? Pardon me, sir. Do you have the time... Do you have the time? Shorten and Brad had let me have it when I looked at my watch. Brass knuckles, southern fried. When things came back in focus, I was in the Bay City Jail. A detective opened the cell and walked me down the corridor. Like our jail, Mr. Marlowe? Fine. What's the matter? Are I hurt? No, no, it's fine. When you came out of your blackout, you started slugging. I had to put you asleep again. Oh, fine. All right, wise guy in here. Captain Kane wants to see you. Come in, Nagama. This is Marlowe, Captain. He likes our jail. Everything is fine. What's the charge, Captain? Drunk in your car, ran up over the curb, and found you were out cold. 
This empty bottle was in your hand. Oh, fine. We don't think it's fine at all. The only reason I'm talking to you instead of the judge is that your papers say you're a private detective. You're on some kind of a case, aren't you? Sure, and my client slugged me, dumped me in my car, ran it up over a curb and poured whiskey on me. Then he phoned for you boys. Maybe it wasn't a client. You're right. It was a southern gentleman named Chris Lavery. Who is your client? I don't reveal my client's name. You're talking to the police. The names of my clients are confidential. If they weren't, I wouldn't have any clients. Okay. But that private license doesn't give you the right to start trouble in Bay City without letting me in on what you're after. I don't like private dicks, Captain. I never met one yet that wasn't a crook. I've heard of people that don't like cops. That seems impossible, doesn't it? Your car's in back of the jail. Get in it, Marlowe, and get out of this town. Good morning, Miss Promsett. How did you get in here without being announced? I told the receptionist it was an emergency. You looked like an emergency. Well, it's an old sickness. Reoccurring black eyes. Mr. Lavery impressed you. His brass knuckles did. Well? Well, nothing. I woke up in the Bay City Jail. Well, right back where we started. Yeah, maybe this is a good place for me to get off. What do you want for $300? A funeral? You were hired to find Crystal Kingsby. It'll be asking too much to start working as a detective. Crystal Kingsby was last seen at Little Fawn Lake. That's a place in the mountains beyond Arrowhead. A few cabins in a private lake owned by Mr. Kingsby. Drive up there and talk to the caretaker. Excuse me, Miss Bronson. Yes? There's a man here to see Mr. Kingsby and Mr. Floyd Greer. Greer? He's a newspaper man. He says it's about something that's happened at the lake, Miss Bronson. I'll find Mr. Kingsby. Show Mr. Greer in. You'd better sit down, too, Mr. Marlowe. So you're a reporter, Mr. Greer. What can I do for you? We just got word about tragedy at Little Fawn Lake, Mr. Kingsby. Tragedy? Uh, do you have a caretaker named William Chess? Well, yes, I do. He's suspected of murder. His wife was found drowned in the lake. Muriel? That's right, Muriel Chess. How long since you've been up there, Mr. Kingsby? Oh, not since last month. How about your wife? Would she know anything about Muriel Chess? Of course not. Nothing more than I would. Mr. Marlowe, would you mind stepping out in the hall with me? Excuse us, please. You'd better get right up to the lake. You think Crystal Kingsby shoved this lady in the lake, eh? It's quite possible she hated Mrs. Chess. And you like the idea, don't you? Yes, I do. Find out what happened and report to no one about it at least. Little Fawn Lake. It reminded me of Adrian Fromset. So beautiful and so cold. First she wants me to find Mrs. Kingsby, then she wants me to prove she's a murderer. She's a sweetheart, Adrian is. Well, I'm back in town at four in the morning and I go straight to Adrian's apartment. If I can tramp through the mountains... She can get waked up. You have to come here. Go to phones, you know. I didn't have a nickel. You know something, Miss Fromson? You look good in this light. What did you find at the lake? Snow. Who's being cute now? You are? There'll be an item on your bill for the bribes I spent finding out that Muriel Chess had another name. What name? Mildred Haviland. Ever hear of her? She married your boss's caretaker because she wanted a place to hide. It seems that a cop was after her. What's this got to do with Crystal Kingsby? Crystal Kingsby and Muriel, or shall I call her Mildred, had a fight over a man. What man? The guy I was slipping the $20 bills to kept claiming he didn't know. But I suppose you do. Yeah. Look. Look what I found. An ankle bracelet. Engraved to Mildred from Chris. It was hidden in Kingsby's cabin. Oh, there could be any number of Chris. Oh, come on now, Miss Fromsett. Lavery's our boy. That ties him up with two women. Crystal Kingsby and Muriel. You think he drowned Muriel, Chess? He would have drowned me if there had been any water handy. Oh, no. Crystal did it. Maybe you could find something else. Uh, a gun, maybe. Oh, uh, look. Just give me the dough I put out for expenses and I'll go on home. Without finding Mrs. Kingsby? Why don't you concentrate on just looking beautiful and quit worrying about guns and dead females and missing ones and that million bucks you want to marry, huh? Crystal drank a lot. She, she had a violent temper. Start being a woman. Quiet down long enough to hear your heartbeat. You might wake up and find it's a different world. I'm paying you to wake up and find Crystal Kingsby. Okay. I'll go back and see Lavery. No. No, you stay away from Lavery. Go back to the lake. You did fine there. All right. But only because you're so full of persuasion. So full of, um... What would you say you were full of, Miss Frompson? My, you're being backward for a detective? No. It's just that I'm tired playing around. As far as the next woman in my life is concerned, it's everything or nothing. Then it better be nothing. You'd be crazy to fall in love with me. Phone me from the lake. Let me see now. 
I'm not to fall in love with you, and I'm not to see Lavery. That's it exactly. Good night, Mr. Marlowe. I got a little sleep, and then I went straight to Lavery's house. I rang the bell. No answer. So I just walked in. He'd forgotten to lock his front door. A woman was coming down the stairs. She had a gun in her hand and for some reason didn't seem at all concerned about my presence there. It's a disgrace. Just a disgrace. I rent this house to him and look at the way he abuses it. Well, just look at it. I'd be glad to if you wouldn't keep pointing that thing at me. Oh, this. Well, if you're one of Mr. Lavery's wild friends, you can get right out of here. I'm not even one of Mr. Lavery's tame friends. Cigarette burns on the furniture, carpets all stained. Look, lady, look. All I want is my rent. I own this house. I'm Mrs. Holbrook. Well, I'm truly enchanted, Mrs. Holbrook. And who are you, may I ask? Finance company, about his car. Behind in his car payments, too. I don't like that. I don't like that at all. Well, we don't like it either. If he was going away, you'd think he'd leave a check under the door or something. But, oh, no. All I found was this gun. I found it on the stairs. Here, you take it. I wonder why he'd leave it on the stairs. He probably had a hole in his pocket. So you've been looking for him upstairs, huh? (laughs) You're a naughty girl. Why, I... I only wanted my money. I think I should call the police. On the other hand, maybe we should stop and consider. Finding a gun doesn't mean anything. Everybody keeps guns. Oh. Oh, do they really? And I'm sure the Bay City Police would frown upon us disturbing them over such a trifle. Oh, you think so? Just let the Ajax Finance Company take care of this. We'll see that you get your money. Well, if you think that you can... Oh, I'm sure I can, Mrs. Holbrook. You be a good girl now and run along. Silly man. You know, you're sweet. Thank you, Mrs. Holbrook. Well, goodbye now. Oh, brother. As soon as she left, I went upstairs. It looked at first as if Lavery had packed a bag and blown town. On his dresser was a woman's handkerchief. I thought of Mrs. Holbrook, but the initials on the handkerchief were A.F. Then I became aware of a muffled sound, and I knew that I'd heard it vaguely ever since I'd come up the stairs. It was the trickle of water running in the bathroom shower. But I didn't bother to turn it off. Not when I saw the five bullet holes neatly drilled through the glass shower door. And behind the door, crumpled on the tiles, the body of that fine southern gentleman, Chris Lavery. Before our stars return in Act Two of Lady in the Lake... Here's Libby Collins, our Hollywood fashion reporter. Reporting on one of the loveliest trousseaus I've ever seen. Hmm, Who's the lucky bride? Well, someone you'll never see on the screen. She was a stand-in for Celeste Holm and Darrell F. Zanuck's Gentleman's Agreement. Oh, any part in that picture would be a great experience. It's a remarkable document of present-day intolerance. Made outstanding by the fine performances of Dorothy McGuire, Gregory Peck, and Celeste Holm. No wonder it was voted the best picture of the year by the New York Motion Picture Critics. While Gentleman's Agreement was in production, Celeste showed me the wedding present she'd bought for her stand-in. What was it? The laciest, filmiest negligee and matching nighty she could find. I hope she added a box of Lux for Lux. <laughs> well, I suggested that. Of course, Lux and Celeste are old friends. Well, then she'll be especially interested in the wonderful news about Lux. It's the result of wartime research, but the new Lux couldn't be produced until new machinery was designed and built. Now it's ready. There's nothing in the world just like these new, tiny diamonds of Lux. So shimmering white, so sheer, so tiny. They not only look different, they act different. They are different. They're so much faster. Right. The little diamonds burst into suds at the touch of water. Wait till women see those thick, abundant suds that last and last. Ladies, just compare these new diamonds of Lux with any other soap you've ever used... They give richer suds. And they keep undies lovely three times as long. Many tests prove it. That's just like getting three pretty slips for the price of one. Smart girls avoid harsh washing methods. Always give undies gentle Lux care. You can be sure anything safe in water is safe in this new Lux. We return you now to William Keeley. Act two of Lady in the Lake, starring Robert Montgomery as Philip Marlowe, and Audrey Totter as Adrian Fromsett. I didn't waste any time getting out of Lavery's house. 
I went straight to Kingsby Publications. They were having a Christmas party, but I managed to convince Adrian Fromsett that I wanted to see her alone. Are you trying to be funny, Mr. Marlowe? Where did you get that gun? At Lavery's house. Lavery's dead. This gun killed him. You hinted that sooner or later I'd find a gun. Were you afraid he'd talk, Miss Fromsett? You, you didn't go to the lake then? No, and here's another little item for you. A handkerchief. Do you recognize it? The initials are A.F. I don't have to ask the obvious question, do I? No. And so far, nobody knows about it but me. And whoever killed Lavery. Yeah, whoever killed him. Or was he the type of guy who kept this sort of souvenir? If I say no, that makes me a murderer or a good suspect. If I say yes, what does that make me? Human, maybe. What are you trying to do? Play the bright, hard lady? You're afraid of life, Miss Fromsett, and people. You don't give yourself a real chance. You never... Come in, Mr. Kingsby. Come in. What's going on? Relax, Mr. Kingsby. You've seen guns before. Maybe I like a sense of humor, but Chris I... Lavery didn't think it was funny either. He's dead. Dead? Did your wife own a gun, Mr. Kingsby? What does my wife have to do with this? Break it to him gently, Miss Fromsett. Derry, I... I hired Mr. Marlowe to look for crystals. I told you, crystals to be left alone. Oh, no, Derry. No, you didn't. What you said was you were tired to death of her. Well, I did... Oh, then you're not. Well, why didn't you say so? I won't have you prying into my private the affairs. The police may be prying into your private affairs, Mr. Kingsby. Your wife was mixed up with Lavery. He's dead. The evidence points to a woman. Now, does she own a gun or doesn't she? I don't know. Just what do you propose to do, Mr. Marlowe? Call the police. What else can I do? Will a thousand dollars make you change your mind? Ah. So your wife did have a gun, huh? Yes, but a thousand dollars... don't think I'm too proud to take it. I'm just too smart to get stuck with it. Very well. I'll tell the authorities anything they want to know. As for you, Adrian, if you think you're going to harm Crystal, you're very much mistaken. Derry. And understand this clearly. If I ever said anything endearing to you, it was because I was lonely. I don't intend to make the same mistake again. Did he say that for my benefit or yours, Miss Fromsett? Mine. All mine. So you lost me my million dollars. Oh, aren't you smart? You deliberately forced a showdown with him. Yeah. He thought you'd make me lose Kingsby, and then I'd come flying straight to your arms. Tell me, Mr. Marlowe, do you always fall in love with your clients? Only the ones in skirts. Well, there's more than one Kingsby on the Christmas tree, Mr. Marlowe, and I'll shake one loose yet. Don't you worry. And as for you, you just haul yourself out of here and send me a bill for your failure. Merry Christmas. What? I said Merry Christmas. I'm glad to have met you, and have a good cry. Mr. Marlowe, wait. Why? Please, step into this other room. I want to talk to you. I, uh, I don't know what your arrangement is with Adrian, there but I... There isn't any anymore. Oh. Well, then I'd like to make one with you. Now, I know my wife has made mistakes, but no matter how things look, Crystal couldn't have killed anyone. She must be found and kept out of this. That'll be tough. You can name your own price. I'm imploring you to help me. And if we keep your wife in the clear, who do we pin the murder on, huh? Well, uh... Well, what do either of us really know about Adrian? Don't you know anything about her? Actually, very little. Oh, I was aware she knew Lavery, just how well I don't just know. Just when I was beginning to like you. You want the facts, don't sure, you? Sure, sure I want the facts. She fires me, you hire me. Happy Phil Marlowe, the boy detective. Where are you going? Back to Lavery's house. Oh? A little Yuletide celebration for the Bay City cops. <laughs> to say you've been handling this gun? How stupid are you, Marlowe? I'm giving you the gun, DeGamo. Maybe I should have tossed it down a sewer. You got an alibi, Marlowe? I told you about Mrs. Holbrook, Captain. She was here ahead of me. It could have been her. And it could have been you. You said you'd come back and get Lavery. Not in those words. But in that tone. I told you not to start trouble in this town. Now, who's your client? This time, you better tell me. His name is Darris Kingsby. He runs a string of magazines. Keep talking. His wife ran out on him about a month ago from a place he has up in the mountains, Little Fawn Lake. Who did she run off with? Well, a good guess would be Lavery. I came here the day before yesterday to ask Lavery if he knew where she was, and for my pains, I landed in the can, in case you've forgotten. We remember, people. What was Lavery's story about Kingsby's wife? He said he hadn't seen her in two months. After you turned me loose, I went up to Little Fawn Lake. Why? Because something peculiar happened up there. They found a woman in the lake, a dame. Named Muriel Chess. Just stick to what happened here. I am. This Muriel Chess had an ankle bracelet. 
It was given to her by somebody named Chris. Oh, what? So she's dead, and upstairs is a corpse named Chris. I see. So you go through this joint, take the gun, collect or steal anything you can, and finally get around to calling us. Well, I don't buy it. What do I care about a drowned dame in a lake? Man's been murdered here, and that's enough for me. Who are you trying to cover, Marlowe? I've told you all I know. Okay, big shot. I'm going upstairs to Garmo. I'll see how the coroner's doing. You, uh... You ever been to Little Fawn Lake, DeGamo? You look kind of interested. We ask the questions, people. And when I mention the lady in the lake, you look still more interested. You heard me. Ever hear of a girl named Mildred Haviland? There was a fellow up there a few weeks ago looking for Mildred Haviland. They tell me he acted like a cop. A tough cop with bad manners. Like you. What's Mildred Haviland got to do with it? She and Muriel Chess were the same girl. She changed her name because she was trying to hide from this tough cop. Does it add up? No. I think it does. They gave me a pretty good description of that cop. They said she... I was about to say that this female had a shady past, and I think you know something about her. That sort of confirms it, doesn't it, DeGarmo? Now we're getting somewhere. You stick your nose in my business, and you'll wake up in an alley with a cat's looking at you. What did she do, this Mildred Dame? Bump somebody off down here? Is that what you had on it? All right, Marlo. Cut it out. What's going on here, DeGarmo? I, uh... He got cute. Put your gun away. You keep on acting smart, Marlo, and you'll see what happens. The only reason I'm giving you another chance to talk is because of what the coroner says. He claims Lavery was killed last night. That doesn't let you out, though. I'll say it doesn't, people. Come on, talk up. You better take a walk, DeGarmo. If you'd let me work him over just a little while. Come on! Take the night off. Yes, sir. Now, if the coroner's right, how can you prove where you were last night? I didn't leave Little Fawn Lake till after midnight. I stopped at Red Service Station halfway down the mountain and got gas. Uh -huh. In San Bernardino, I got a cup of coffee at the Dinner Bell Diner. The waitress with the big eyes will remember me because it was 2 a.m. and I was the only customer in the place. What about Mrs. Holbrook? Oh, you'll love Mrs. Holbrook. She's charming. But I don't know where she is. One of my boys upstairs just checked. She's gone to Las Vegas. We'll have her back here tomorrow. That about winds up everything, doesn't it? Do you mind if I go now? There's still a charge of striking an officer. You funny guys kill me. Captain, before you toss me in a cell, did you ever hear of a dame named Mildred Haviland? No. That's the real name of that woman drowned in the lake. Ask DeGamo about her. Why should I? Because DeGamo knew Lavery and he knew Mildred Haviland. Well, they're both dead. That's a big statement, Marlo. Why do you think DeGamo slapped me around? Look, you turn me loose and I'll do some finding out tonight. You can too, by talking to DeGamo. You know what you're doing, don't you? You're practically forcing on me the rottenest job a police official can have, investigating one of his own men. I'll work with you in any way you want. All right. Here's what you do. Call the desk sergeant and get him to give you a nice, quiet cell. Oh. For a minute, I thought you were on the level. But you want me out of the way, don't you? So you and DeGamo can fix this up any way that suits you. Why, you... This wasn't Christmas Eve, and if my kids weren't waiting for me to... All right, you didn't murder Lavery. The charge of taking a swing at DeGarmo is dismissed. Just do me a great big favor and get out of here. Go on, blow! I made a phone call as soon as I left. I have a friend downtown on one of the newspapers. I asked him to dig up anything he could for me on Mildred Haviland. He said he'd call me at my hotel in an hour. Come in. Good evening. And a Merry Christmas to you, Miss Ramsey. I had to see you. Why? I didn't leave that handkerchief in Lavery's house. You still worrying about that? I, I read a story once about a killer who left clues around to point at somebody else. That was a story. Oh, I wouldn't kill anyone. I wouldn't. Oh, of course not. Just a nice, sweet campfire girl. I'm all mixed up tonight. If it I... turns out that you're the little girl who held the hot and smoking pistol, you're going to be really mixed up. You think I could do a thing like that? Yes. I thought you liked me. The girl I like won't be looking for a million-dollar marriage or trying to hang a murder on another woman. What will this girl do? Take care of me. Unglamorous, isn't it? Would you consider buying me a drink? No. I'm expecting a call. But there's a time and place for everything. This is Christmas Eve. See, I wasn't kidding. Hello? Dugan. Go ahead, Dugan. Here's what we have on the Mildred Haviland. She was 
mixed up in a suicide about a year and a half ago. Just a minute, will you? Hey, Miss Frompson, would you mind leaving? I thought you were off the case. Who's your client now? I never reveal a client's name. It's Kingsby, isn't it? I have to eat, don't I? Blow me a kiss and close the door gently as you leave. I'll call you if I need you. Drexel 3... Three, three, nine, one. I'm sorry, Dugan. Well, uh, this Mildred Haviland was a nurse for a doctor named Almore in Bay City. Almore, eh? So one night, Florence Almore, that's the doctor's wife, was found dead. A cop named DeGarmo investigated. Verdict suicide. What happened to Mildred Haviland? She, uh, she disappeared right after that. Anybody figure Florence Almore was murdered? Uh, just a folks. Mr. and Mrs. Grayson raised a big fuss at first. Since then, they've clammed up. Somebody scared them silly. Somebody has, has he? Where do the Graysons live? Bay City. Eugene Grayson. Names in the phone book. I'm much obliged to you, Dugan. What name did you say? Marlowe. I'm a private detective, Mr. Grayson. I want to talk to you about your daughter. You leave us alone. We've told the police everything. I only want to help you, Mrs. My Grayson. daughter's dead. Can you bring her back? We've had just about enough, Mr. Marlowe. He was here before for one solid hour. We don't want to talk anymore. He was here, eh? That cop. He thinks she committed suicide, doesn't he? Well, I don't. I think your daughter was murdered. I think Mildred Haviland murdered her. Get out. He covered up for her. That's why he wants to keep you quiet. My wife told you to get out. Haven't we had trouble enough? Leaving Grayson's house, I saw this other car down the block. Two miles later, it was still on my tail. I stepped on the gas and cut across town, but I couldn't shake it. All right, then I'd stop. As I started to slow down, he pulled up alongside of me and turned a spotlight full in my eyes. At 40 miles an hour, you hit a ditch pretty hard. In the split second before I passed out, I saw who it was. DeGarmo. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Our stars will return in a moment with Act Three of Lady in the Lake. Our guest this evening is lovely blonde Dorothy Patrick, who won so many admirers as Mrs. Jerome Kern on the screen. She's just completed her latest picture in brilliant company, Robert Taylor, Audrey Totter, and Herbert Marshall. Do you think the fans will envy your playing Bob Taylor's wife in metro goldwyn Mayer's new thriller, High Wall, Dorothy? Well, perhaps, until he's accused of murdering me. You know, Bob Taylor does a marvelous job with his spine-tingling role. That picture packs plenty of mystery and high-powered drama. Oh, and romance, too. Yes, you and Audrey Totter, who, by the way, is in our radio play tonight, have won high praise from the critics for your performances and from women for your smart costumes. Audrey and I were both ecstatic about some of the gorgeous blouses designed by MGM for to wear in the picture. John Kennedy may be interested in what happened one day when we were lunching at the studio. What was that, Dorothy? Well, someone jiggled the waiter's arm and he spilled some bullion on Audrey's blouse. The one she was wearing for a scene in High Wall. She was almost sure it was ruined, but... But uh, the wardrobe department came to the rescue with Lux. Well, how did you know? Oh, it happens every day. In Hollywood studios and in homes all over the country. That's not news. But there is big news about Lux. Lux has been improved. Yes, wonderful as Lux has always been, these new tiny diamonds of Lux are even better. Well, that's certainly interesting news, John. Women everywhere will be thrilled with these new tiny diamonds of Lux. They're so shimmering white and so sheer and so tiny. They look different from any other soap, and they act different. They are different. They're so much faster. Why, you can see the little diamonds burst into suds at the touch of water. And they make richer suds that last and last. And, as Libby Collins can tell you, they do more for you, too. That's right. The new diamonds of Lux actually remove soil other types of suds can't. They leave things cleaner, fresher. Colors stay lovely up to three times as long. Many tests prove it. So it's wise to avoid harsh washing methods. You can be sure anything safe in water is safe in this new Lux. Here's Mr. Keeley at the microphone. 
Act three of Lady in the Lake, starring Robert Montgomery as Philip Marlowe and Audrey Totter as Adrian Fromsett. I don't really know if Tagamo had figured on killing me in that crash or not. I don't think it much mattered. In any event, I'd be taken care of. When I came to, there I was, soaked in whiskey in an empty bottle on the floorboards. But I got one break. I didn't sleep quite as long as DeGamo figured. I must have looked real cute crawling out of what was left of my car. I was dizzy and sick, my face so bloody and my legs so numb I couldn't walk. Across the highway was a gas station. It was closed for the night, but outside was a public telephone booth. Number, please. Los Angeles. Number, please. Drexel. Drexel 3... Three, three, nine, one. Your number, please. Bay City, 187. Thank you. Deposit 15 cents for five minutes, please. You deposited too much, sir. When Shut you finished up. your call... Shut up and get me my number. Hello? This, this is Marlowe. Oh, so you've changed your mind. I'm in a phone booth in a gas station on the south road. You're where? The south road, two miles out, suppose gas station. Why are you talking like that? Come and get me. Come and get... Hello? 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 Well, so you're awake. How do you feel? The way I look. You look a lot better than you did in spite of the iodine. I've been working over you for an hour. How, how did I get here? I brought you here in my car. From then on, the doorman helped me. Does the doorman think anything of dumping bruised, unconscious men on your living room sofa? I told him you were drunk and had fallen down. Afraid you'll call the police? Oh, no, I love policemen. Especially one named DeGarmo. Who's DeGarmo? Just a hard-working cop who figured to frame me the same way Lavery did. He pulls this little stunt and then calls headquarters saying he's a public-spirited citizen reporting a drunk driver. Only you got to me first. I, uh, much obliged. What's Igamo got to do with all this? That's what I keep asking myself. How did he know I was going to visit Florence Almore's folks? Who? A girl who committed suicide, maybe. About a year and a half ago. Well, why wonder? Just get off the case. Why be a private detective at all? Why eat? You only get hungry again. Oh, you don't have to make a living that way. You can write, remember? And I can help you. Oh, we'd be fine together. In everything, we'd be fine together. If only you'd... If only I'd what? Oh, you don't think you can trust me. I want you to know that you can. It's true, I... I've been a long time wanting things. Thinking I wanted things. What do you want now? I want to take care of you. Maybe it isn't glamorous, but I want to be your girl. That's what I want for Christmas, and don't you laugh at me. I'm not laughing. Come here. You close your eyes, too, don't you, darling? Why are you frowning? You're still not convinced I didn't kill Lavery. Yeah. How can you think that? I have to think of everything. Oh, don't. Just think of me. Quit being a detective, please. I can't. Till this is over. You're in love with me. I might have killed someone, but it doesn't matter. It has nothing to do with it. Oh, I was going to be the bright girl with big league boots and a glass heart stepping over people. It must have been somebody else. I'm going to start out all over again. Promise it? Crying? I always do on Christmas Eve. Oh, I wish I could tell you how I feel. You mean you've got that, uh, I'm scared, but it's wonderful feeling? Yes. Scared, but it's... Yeah. Scared. Well, you're not scared of me. I don't know. I'm glad. It proves how you feel. You see, I'm glad about everything. I've never felt this way before. You go to sleep now. I'll see you in the morning. Good night. Good night. We 
were eating breakfast the next morning in the kitchen. She was like a little girl. I don't know, maybe it was because it was Christmas Day. Anyway, she had our future together all figured out. The first thing we'll do is leave here and go to New York. Yeah, New York, sure. What'll we use for money? Oh, we can start with the store you wrote and go on from there. We'll make lots of money. Together we'll own the world. Sure, and if you're the guilty girl, where does that leave me? Besides, I got another worry this morning. Oh, what other worry, darling? DeGamo. By now, by now he knows I'm on the loose. He'll start on the prowl for me with a cold, howling heart of hate and a gun full of bullets to stop me from talking about what I don't know. Oh, but you're safe here at least for... I won't answer it. You better answer it. No. Adrian, open the door. Kingsby. Let him in. Just a minute, Darius. What's the idea? I've been phoning you for an hour. I've had the receiver off. Well, I thought you might know where I could find Marlowe. He knows. Oh, Marlowe, I've been searching everywhere for you. Yeah? I even went to the police. Oh, fine. They're looking for you, too. They happen to follow you here? Yes, yes, two detectives have been following me all morning. Why didn't you invite them up? I don't know what your troubles are, but I have my own. All right, let's hear yours. Well, I've been trying to find you because, well, my wife's in Bay City. How do you know? Well, Crystal phoned me. She's in trouble. The police are after her. She needs money. She wants money. Take it to her. With two detectives following me? Oh, no. You're going to take her the money. Oh, I am, am I? Look, there's $500 in this envelope. It's all I could raise on a holiday. It's worth anything to me to get it to her. You've used that word anything a couple of times. How much is anything? You'll get $5,000, Marlowe. That's a deal, Santa Claus. What's a deal? I don't want you near her. She's trouble. Two people have been killed already. Maybe she has some answers. Well, what else can I do? Stay here and let the cops come after me? Oh, we'll figure out a way for both of us. And them. end up where? In a gutter with my teeth kicked in, smelling of whiskey I never drank, running down alleys? The only way out of this is to see Crystal this south. No, let someone else solve it. And then there's the money. Five grand, just in case my typewriter breaks down and I can't write stories. It's enough to start and on. And more than enough to bury you with. No, I won't let you go. Still trying to make me duck the wind-up, eh? Why? Any personal reason? No, don't be ridiculous. I'm not. If I run away and never find the answers, I'll never know for sure about you. Will I? All right, then. Go. Where do I meet your wife, Mr. Kingsby? In front of a cocktail bar called the Peacock Cafe. It's on the main boulevard near 14th Street. Here, take my scarf. Wear it. She'll recognize You leave first, Kingsby. Take those detectives on a tour of Chinatown. Keep them following you while I go down to Bay City. Good luck, Marlowe. Thanks. You realize, of course, it may be a trap that Kingsby set for you himself? Yeah. Oh, please don't go. I told you once, it's everything or nothing. I'm going to trust you. If you're not on the level, I'll get a head full of bullets. If you are, I'll see you in Bay City. Get hold of Captain Kane and come after me. Well, how will we know where to find you? I'll make you? Crystal take me to wherever she's hiding out. You'll phone me from there? Maybe I won't be able to. Well, I... then how will we... There's a box of rice in your kitchen. Quoting a girl named Fromset, I read a story once, how a detective carried rice around in his pocket. It left a very nice trail. Maybe it'll work again. Are the keys in your car? Yes. I'll go down the back stairs to the garage. Goodbye, Miss Fromset. You've been charming company. Wait. This is the payoff, isn't it? Say that again about the... I'm scared, but it's a wonderful feeling. I'm scared but it's wonderful. Goodbye. I didn't have to wait long in front of the Peacock Cafe. The girl hardly glanced at me as she walked over to a shop window next door and stood there waiting. I tried being casual as I sauntered up. Give me the money. You get right to the point, don't you, Mrs. Kingsby? Just hand it over. Where are you staying? What makes it your business? An envelope in my pocket with 500 bucks. $500? Do you want it, or would you rather just crab about it? Give it to me. I will, but not here. Come on. How far is it? Not far. I, uh, I promised I'd phone your husband as soon as I found you. He can wait another two minutes. You can phone from my room. To you, Mrs. Kingsby. Close the door. Yeah. It's kind of hot in here, isn't it? I wouldn't think of my guest being uncomfortable. What's out there beyond that window? The roof. You must come again sometime. We'll take a sun bath. Now quit stalling. It's convenient having a pair of them, isn't it? A pair of them? A pair of little guns. Little guns that kill just the same as big guns. Why don't you take it out of your coat pocket? Yes, I will. It is nice, isn't it? 
Now, if you'll hand over that envelope... That was a good act you put on as Mrs. Holbrook, the landlady. You weren't so bad yourself as the finance company. The cops say Lavery was killed the night before we met. What I can't figure is what you came back for the next morning. I was looking for money, and I still am. I'd be crazy to carry any money with me. Think of my trading position. Where is it? If you haven't got that money, You'll I'll... what? Shoot me? Don't you think I will? Sure I do, Mildred. What? I said, sure I do, Mildred. You don't think I really believe you're Crystal Kingsby, do you? Although Kingsby believed it when you talked to him on the phone, didn't he? No, you're Mildred Haviland. You murdered the Almore woman. I didn't. She was asphyxiated in a car. It was an accident. And the lady in the lake, instead of being you, is Crystal Kingsby. Was that an accident? Yes. Yes, it was. Crystal and I, we, we traded clothes one night, and she had on my things, and I had on hers. And we went across the lake to see if we could fool Bill. Bill Chess, my husband. And Crystal fell in the lake and sank to the bottom. Yes. Huh? Yes, she did. I didn't know what to do. So you ran away to El Paso. You met Lavery there. His death was an accident, too, I suppose. He took a gun into the shower bath. I don't know. I don't know what... Lavery was the only man who knew the real identity of the lady in the lake, wasn't he, Mildred? I'm through talking. And you'd better have that money on you. You can't shoot, Mildred. Not with a safety catch on. Here, let me fix it for you. I'll kill you. Get that gun out of your head. Come on. Let me give you a tip, Mildred. Never try to shoot a man when he's looking at you. I'm frightened. Oh, I'm so frightened. Get me out of here. Please, please take me with you. I'll bet that act went over big with Lavery. Please. It went over big with DeGarmo, too, didn't it? DeGarmo? He covered up for you on the Almore case. Every time you look at a man, he falls over, doesn't he, Mildred? Oh, I'm a nice girl. You don't understand me. I'm a nice girl. Yeah, you're a lovely girl. I'd like to play dolls with you. What's that? The cops, Mildred. I invited them here to meet Crystal Kingsby. They're going to be quite surprised to see you. No. Oh, no, you wouldn't. Come in, Adrian, and bring the gallant Captain Kane with you. Get him up, Mona. DeGarmo, honey. Hit him with that gun, honey. Kill him, kill him. Stay just where you are, Millie. Don't, don't talk to me like that, sweetheart. DeGarmo doesn't like you anymore, Mildred. Yes, he does, don't you, honey? You weren't expecting DeGarmo, were you? He was expecting the other cops, honey, not you. It's been a long time since he's seen you, Mildred. Ever since you double-crossed him, you ran away and changed your name from Mildred to Muriel... And married that poor little guy named Chess. The has been looking for you. Have you, honey? Why don't you laugh, Mildred? Like he's laughing. Take care of him, will you? Let's get out of here. You're not going anyplace. I thought you were dead. I wish you were. Because you're a murderer. Oh. And this time, dead's the way I'm going to leave you. Oh, that's crazy. You're talking crazy. I went crazy the night Florence Almore died and you made a clown out of me. Even after you ran away, I still loved you. You made a bad cop out of me, Millie. But this is the end of it. Don't do it, DeGamo. She's the killer. Don't get yourself in any more trouble. Take her in if you're a good cop. Lay off, people. The Almore case won't come up. They'll convict her for Crystal Kingsby's murder or Lavery's. You'll be clear. I'll be clear. This is her gun. If she dies by it and you die by it, I'll be clear, because I'll be the officer who investigates. You're a fool, DeGarmo. I'm no fool, and I'll be a good cop. I'll be the best cop in the world. But she isn't going to hurt anybody again. No. No, please. I don't, honey. I love you. I'm your girl. I would never... Oh. First you cover up a murder for her. And then you kill her. It doesn't make any sense, does it, DeGamo? Some things don't. Petticoat fever, eh? Yeah. We all get it, people. We all get it. I once had petticoat fever myself. I took a chance and lost. When you walked in that door instead of Kane, a lot of things suddenly ended for me. I'm scared. But it isn't wonderful anymore. I'll say you lost. My drunk driving frame didn't stick, but this one will. How does it feel dying in the dirty middle of somebody else's love affair? I don't want to seem selfish, but I'm thinking of my own. I followed your ice here, Marlo. Thanks a lot. I followed it and I kicked it into the street so nobody else would follow it. So don't be expecting any friends or relations. How did you know about it? How do you suppose? Your girl, Adrian. That's a lie. How else do you think I know? That was a cheap gag, that rice. But that's the way all private dicks end up. A last cheap trick. A cheap double cross. You're in the same boat I am. But you're going to be in it dead. Kane! 
I never thought you'd get here. <laughs> gags. Still thinking of gags. You want me to turn around, huh? <laughs> There's nobody out on that roof. How crazy do you think I am? Be careful, Kane. That gun of his is pointed right at me. Cut it out, Marlow. Get him with the first slug, Kane, or he'll get me. I'm getting you right now. <laughs> gags. Nothing but gags. Marlow, you all right? Yeah. I'm all right. What about him? Take a look. For his sake, I hope he's dead. I'd have been here a lot sooner, but he messed up your trail of rice. You got the story on all this? Yeah, I got the story. All right, let's have it. I'll write it. I'll see that you get the first copy, fresh out of the typewriter. What about her, this dame? Mildred Haviland. She murdered the Almore woman, Crystal Kingsby, and Chris Lavery. Oh. The Garmo killed her? Yeah. He had a wonderful motive. He was in love with her. Well, I had promised Kane the first copy, and there it is. The grandma may not be so hot, but I'll let it... Oh, yeah. You're wondering about her, aren't you? About Adrian. DeGamo had said she tipped him off. What had happened was that DeGamo had overheard Adrian's phone call to Kane. That's how DeGamo got to me first. Those things happen sometimes, but Adrian... May I come in? <laughs> come in. Have you got the tickets? Yes, to New York. One way. <laughs> Are you scared? Mm-hmm. But it's wonderful. In just a moment, our stars will return for their curtain calls with a very important announcement for next week. Ladies, are you in Lever Brothers' sensational fur coat contest? Remember, they're giving away $100,000 worth of furs and cash every week for four more weeks. First prize every week is a $3,000 mink coat. Next prizes are three fur coats worth $1,000 apiece, fur jackets, fur scarves, and 250 crisp $10 bills. 329 prizes every week. You're just in time to get in on the second of five big weekly contests. 1,645 prizes in all, so hurry. Your entry for this week's contest must be received by midnight, February 16th. Entries received after that date will be entered in next week's contest. You still have a chance to win over 1,300 prizes. It's easy to win. Here's all you do. On entry blank, available from your dealer or any piece of paper... Write 25 words or less telling why you like any of six famous Lever products. Lux Flakes, Lux Toilet Soap, Life Boy, Rinseau, Swan, or Spry. You can send in as many letters as you wish. Just be sure to enclose with each one a box top or a wrapper from any one of these six products. Print your name and address on your letter, together with the name and address of the dealer from whom you buy your Lever products. Mail your letter, together with box top or wrapper, to Lever... L-E-V-E-R, Lever Fur Contest, Box 1, New York 8, New York. Only residents of the continental United States, including Alaska and Hawaii, are eligible. These contests are subject to all federal, state, and local regulations and to complete rules printed on official entry blanks, which you can get from your dealer. Winners of the big prizes will be announced on this program. Here's our producer, William Keeley. In this season of awards, I wish we had a special radio award for tonight's stars who gave such thrilling performances in Lady in the Lake, Bob Montgomery and Audrey Totter. <laughs> Bob, as one director to another, you deserve an orchid for your fine job of directing Lady in the Lake. For the screen, as well as acting in it. Well, thank you, Bill. 
It did give me a chance to use a camera technique that I'd always been interested in. You mean letting the audience see the action through the hero's eyes? You might call it uh, audience participation. <laughs> yes. Whatever happens to me in the picture happens to the audience, <laughs> which is quite an experience for moviegoers. Well, it was quite an experience for me kissing a man who wasn't there and talking to a camera lens. <laughs> but I'm sure, Audrey, that every man in the audience got quite a thrill from the illusion of playing opposite Audrey Totter on the screen. Tell me, Bob, are you going to use that same technique again sometime? Well, it's a little early to say, Bill, but Audrey and I are currently making a picture together at Universal International called the Saxon Charm. Which we look forward to with great interest. Uh, Bill, John Kennedy mentioned earlier a very important announcement about next week. Yes, yeah, something special uh, coming up on Lux. One of the most exciting evenings of the year. In fact, one of the year's outstanding events in radio. Not because we say so but because theatergoers all over America have said so in selecting their favorite motion picture for 1947. Now, what picture is it, Bill? Don't keep us in suspense. I'm sorry, Audrey, but we're pledged to secrecy. You mean you can't tell us a thing about it? No, you'll have to use your imagination. But I can assure you it's the motion picture that moviegoers of America voted most popular of all in 1947. Not only that, but we're presenting it with two of America's best love stars who helped to make the picture so delightful. Uh, how was the picture selected, Bill? Through a nationwide poll conducted by Dr. George Gallup's Audience Research Incorporated for Photoplay Magazine, the winner to receive Photoplay's coveted gold medal award. The name will be announced in Photoplay Magazine's next issue, which reaches the stands this Wednesday, February 11th. Till then, our lips are sealed except to say that it's the play that our audience themselves selected the, the one above all others you'll most want to hear, with two superlative and famous stars. You've got me so curious now, I've got to listen, Bill. I certainly wouldn't miss it, Bill. Good night. Good, Good night. night, and be sure to listen in next Monday. <laughs> Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents, with two great stars, the screenplay America voted as its favorite during 1947. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. If you're a young man from 17 to 31, the United States Navy offers you perhaps the greatest opportunity of your life to continue your education, enjoy high pay, clean living, travel, and adventure in a service that has won the admiration of the world. Get in touch with your nearest Navy recruiting office for full information on life in America's great peacetime Navy. Audrey Totter appeared by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of Sinclair Lewis' Cast Timberlane, starring Spencer Tracy and Lana Turner. Heard in our cast tonight were Tom Tully as Captain Kane, Gerald Moore as Kingsby, Bill Johnstone as DeGarmo, Francis Robinson as Mildred, and George Neese, Eddie Marr, Robert Griffin, Janet Scott, Herbert Butterfield, and Marie Windsor. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is rebroadcast to our men and women overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. And this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear America's favorite screenplay of 1947. Pepsodent and won by three to one. Yes, in a recent survey, families throughout America compared new Pepsodent toothpaste with the brands they'd been using at home. By an overwhelming average of three to one, they preferred new Pepsodent with Irium over any other brand they tried. They said new Pepsodent toothpaste tastes better, makes breath cleaner, makes teeth brighter. Yes, with families who made comparison tests, Pepsodent won by three to one. Be sure to listen next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of America's most popular screenplay of 1947. Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>